how are the Lummi currently practicing food sovereignty? We try and keep try and keep our traditional foods in our events and in our cooking. Well, I think the main way we practice food sovereignty is that we have our own aquaculture now, where we grow our own clams and oysters and seed the the bay and stuff, and we grow that. We have our own hatcheries that we grow on fish, so that we can try to sustain, you know, some of our traditional foods. I think that's the best way I can define our food sovereignty: is that we're we're producing our traditional foods that we usually harvest off the, the beaches and the sea. Could you talk about the cultural meanings and significance of traditional foods? Well, <coughs> we grew up with um, salmon and oysters and deer meat. Pretty, pretty much everything was traditional a long time ago. Do you know why or how agriculture and food traditions have been lost in our community? I think it's up to the future generations to keep those, those, those ways of and diet, so they're still here. I think that they're just you got to pull them away from McDonald's and uh, you know and, and and teach them how to eat their their traditional food. Mm -hmm. We were rich here as as Lummi people. We never had to really want anything. So you know, there, we, we had abundance of salmon. We had abundance of shellfish. All we had to do was sit on the beach and wait for the tide to do whatever it's going to do, and we could go eat. I think clams and Oysters and mussels and things were a big part of our diet, probably 60%, because salmon runs weren't here all in the wintertime. There wasn't big salmon runs, but stuff, so we had to. I think we had clam gardens and stuff like that, so we could we could harvest seafood even when the tide didn't go out that far. So we, and those are probably some of the things that have disappeared is that how to build clam gardens and stuff like that. Foods, like the fast food restaurants and took over, you know, and I know a lot of young kids don't even like traditional foods, you know, they rather have McDonald's or, you know, other foods like that, so. system has basically changed. Everywhere you look now there's fast food so our kids just become too much um, fast food and junk food more than our traditional food. Do Lummi people often need to travel off the reservation for food? No, we do it all right here in our waters and digging and hunting and fishing. All the foods are still here, like, I'll bring you out to, to find uh, what my grandma would call squat, and that's a traditional name for, if the kids nowadays call them grunters, because you, you hit them and they make a little noise, and they'll, err, err, err. What does food sovereignty mean to you and your family or your community? I believe it's just our life, huh? Mm -hmm. It's traditional. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot from my grandmother. I lived next door to her. She was, you know, she would just teach us, and that was her day-to-day -day life. Is that she lived a lot off the land and off off the water. And, but as she got older in life, she she was in a wheelchair and stuff, and she would just wheel herself up to the porch and then point to us and we'd go run and get what she wanted. Like if the northeaster was blown, north wind was blown real hard for a couple days, you ever see the wind, it just ices up and the wind blows hard in the wintertime? What that does is it blows so hard it kills like the octopus and they roll up on the beach and then a couple of days after the wind stops you go down and you can you can find them on the beaches. And that was one of her ways of, of telling stories or, or at least keeping that technique of, of which she liked to eat alive. In a traditional language, 
she she wouldn't even call it octopus. She would call it a scamo. That's what how you pronounce octopus in a Lummi language, scamo. What is the connection between culture and traditional foods? Salmon is the connection. Always been. Just, salmon just even to this this day is 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 the mainstay of, of the Lummi people. As far as what we put away or or whatever we turn it into cash and buy other things, it's always been an economy. Back in the day we you know, we even traded salmon with Yakima and people like that. You know, if we didn't eat it we traded it for something else to eat. What were the challenges you faced uh, when it came to like fighting or getting the word out for food sovereignty? The um commodity food is challenging, you know, food sovereignty because you know we can't um according, you know, we go by um, and cannot um, provide some of our foods, you know, like how, how they're cooked and canned and baked and all that. So um, I think we need to, that we need to try to get our own food sovereignty laws here. So I'm thinking that might go along with what happened to my brother. He um, smoked fish all his life and he, he was a uh, had a pretty good business going with you know, so sell the smoked fish and can it. And um, he got online and he some non natives wanted to buy it. And he was selling it to them but he got stopped. They made him stop because he wasn't USD approved. You know, which is sad. You know, a long time ago we shared all our food. And we never had the laws, yeah. and nobody got sick, you know, but you know, the USDA is stepping in and saying it's got to be approved. Yeah. That's one of the things that our people can't do. I think a, the challenge was the, state of, was the state of Washington, and not, not honoring the treaty that we had with the United States, and putting barriers in place that we couldn't couldn't harvest salmon or, or shellfish in our traditional territory, saying that we couldn't go off the reservation and, and, and harvest fish or shellfish. Are there specific periods of points in history that began to disrupt the local food system? What was it about this period that impacted the Lummi community? Like, the Bolt decision is, is a landmark case through the United States. It's, it's huge, and, and, and it's still... To this day, I think a lot of some of it is still trying to be determined of, of what's what. And Bolt says, "I'm not going to determine it for you guys. You're going to have to figure it out." But you do have right. You mean with the Bolt decision? Because they stopped us from fishing in certain areas that belong to some of the reservation. We fought for our work, fishing rights, and it was overturned by Judge Bolt which gave us more fishing grounds and more resources and traditional food. I think it impacted us when they put us on this reservation and moved us from the islands of where the traditional homelands were, is that we had to re relearn how to live and relearn how to be in a different place than where you're really from and not be able to move beyond those boundaries. And they tried to, and the U.S. government tried to turn us into farmers, but it didn't work. We just, that's not who we are, we're fishermen. So, you know, we tried, but it failed because we're, we're not farmers, we're fishermen. And that's hard to get out of your DNA. Would you say the importance of food sovereignty is being passed down to the younger generations? Yeah, I yeah. think that it's all there, just that they have to, and it's our job to teach, it, they, you know, nobody comes into this world knowing what the heck to do. So it's our job to teach them those skills. And, and I think that I am fortunate, and my grandchildren are fortunate, that we live on the beach, real close to the beach, that we can just walk across the road and get whatever we want. I can go right over there. We go down there. We can get oysters, clams, crab, small fish. Anything we want is right there. Dining room table. What rights are still being denied? Are we still fighting for certain rights? We're, yeah, we're always going to be fighting for, for our rights. You know, and, and everybody's after the same, <clears throat> the same resource, so there's always going to be challenges to, 
who has the right to that and who doesn't. And so we're always going to be in discussion or in court trying to uphold those um, the rights that we believe we have under the treaty. Some of the fishing rights. And been here almost five years, and I see Elaine Wayne going to the sovereignty meetings trying to get the get it approved. And after all these years, it still hasn't been approved. And she still attends those meetings to support and try to get it approved. Getting that tradition. Getting that tradition. USDA approved. What do you think is the most important thing to focus on going forward? Getting that food sovereignty law passed for the USDA for us. Yeah, I think that's the most important thing. Continue to teach our young people traditional foods and food sovereignty. I think hatcheries is, is huge. I think that we have to learn how to develop a better way of, of growing the fish because, you know, the habitat is gone, the rivers are banged up, everything, you know, the, the mountains and the habitat is, it just isn't there anymore. So it's going it, to, you can't even repair that in our lifetime. Mm-hmm. Hatcheries have been around since the 1800s. They, they, it's, not, they, it's not new. But we just have to develop a better technique in doing it. We have the science and everything to, to do it, we just have to, I hate to say it, we're just going to have to throw more resources at it to learn how to do it better. The world is, is changing, so how are we going to change with it to try to stay as, as we have always been? So we're going to have to learn to bend a little bit and change with that too, to, it, which is probably hatcheries. And things have changed even in my lifetime. I can't even imagine what they changed in my dad's lifetime and how that's going to be in my son's lifetime. and then my grandson's lifetime as a fisherman and things are going to change. So if we don't start getting ahead of it now, trying to catch up, there isn't going to be anything for my grandson. So that's kind of a lot of my focus now is, is, is how do we develop and produce more hatcheries for, for the good of all Puget Sound and, and people of the Salish Sea. Mm-hmm.